2021. Go ahead, Rachel. I'm so happy to be here. Thank you all so much. It's been an incredible two days and we are just so grateful for the robust conversation and the generosity that um, not only our facilitators, but our attendees have brought. Um, if you are streaming live with us, you are also welcome to comment on the live stream and we will be circling back to see what questions may be coming up for you because the PAL Summit is not just about a flash in the pan moment. It's about um, connecting us all together so that these conversations can continue to make change throughout the year. And um, I would love to uh, introduce the session as Ask Me Anything, um, which Tamanya and I are here to just engage with either whatever has come up uh, throughout the summit that you're like, oh, I have additional questions or we have not touched on yet, or it's just on your mind and your heart. Um, or maybe it's on your task list or in your organizational workspace and you, you want to engage. So um, to prepare the space, I would love to pass it to Tamanya for our land acknowledgements and welcome. Um, hello, I'm Tamanya Garza. I am the um, PAL National Director of Community and Justice Initiatives. And I'm also the Chief Rep for Philadelphia. Um, I am coming to you from the land of the Lene Lenape people whose historical territory includes the places colonially known as Delaware, New Jersey, Pennsylvania, New York, Long Island, and the Lower Hudson Valley. For more than 10,000 years, the Lenape people have been stewards of these lands, as well as the River of Human Beings or the Delaware River. Over the past 250 years, many of the Lenape people were forcibly removed from their ancestral lands and dispersed throughout the country, though some families remained. These families continue the traditions of their ancestors to this day. The violence that removed the Lenape from their homeland is a powerful part of the history of Pennsylvania. And we acknowledge that in this moment and that we work and live on these very lands. This is the story of our entire country. We encourage you to learn about the lands where you live and work and the history of the people who lived there before colonization. Many who still live there today, though they are often starved of the very resources they protected for so long, including access to housing, sustainable food practices, safety, clean water, and the land where they once lived with their families. This information was provided in part by www.lenape-nation.org. Thank you. Thank you so much, Demania. We acknowledge and receive um, that, uh, that commitment to um, identify this land. Um, I'd like to share community agreements in the space. My name is Rachel Spencer Hewitt. I am the Director of um, Programming and Resources here at PAL. And our agreements are, as a session participant, you commit with us to welcome all caregiving responsibilities and realities in the background or foreground of any meetups, phone calls, and exchanges, and embrace your life in our pursuit of productive and supportive practices. As a session participant, you commit with us to creating a transgender and non-binary affirming space. All language that includes but is not limited to mother, parent, dad, caregiver, et cetera, et cetera applies to any individual who identifies with that term. As a session participant, you commit with PAL to creating spaces rooted in justice and anti-racism in our structures, practices, policies, principles, and producing. As a session participant, you commit with us to creating safe and supportive spaces for disability access and inclusion and all access needs present in the space. Welcome everyone. I would also like to share um, some safety agreements in terms of what it means to engage in a virtual space with each other. Um, and so I want to ensure that everyone feels um, taken care of. That includes all of our participants and folks watching online. We prioritize safety over civility. So if at any point in this session you feel unsafe, please speak up for your own safety using your voice, the chat, or even private messaging myself or any of our colleagues, if that feels most supportive. Whether it's uh, something as obvious as Zoom bombing or aggressions that may be micro to the outside but are not micro to your experience, we will honor your experience and engage immediately. So please interrupt the meeting if it means your safety because that's our priority today. Okay, welcome. Thank you all so much for joining us in the morning of our final day. I just wanna lift up 
our upcoming sessions, no more 10 out of 12. And uh, the five day rehearsal week is coming up next. We get to talk with representatives from Design Action, Clint Ramos, the designer, um, and from no more 10 out of 12, the extraordinary collective that is really just taking this a mission and driving it into the hearts of, of organizations with Lindsay Jones. And then also one of um, my great advisors and I consider a mentor, Patricia McGregor, a director uh, who has been uh, not using the 10 out of 12 for an extended period of time for award-winning productions and uh, utilizing five-day work weeks. And we get to talk to them at 11.30 today. Um, and then join us at one o'clock to speak with Karen Olivo on advocacy and centering humanity for our final day. And it just makes me excited for next year. Oh, so in this session, AMA, ask me, ask us anything, AUA, um, feel free to say what you would love to build on for, for the next year. Um, so I'd like to invite our session participants and anyone online to, um, to drop into the chat, uh, anything that you would like us to talk about. But Tamani and I will always have uh, something to share in. So um, I'm gonna let, the space live for to give folks time and to money, feel free to share anything. Oh, and thank you to our true biz ASL interpreters today, Juan and Valerie. Yes, thank you so much for being here to create this access. Yeah, so we'll let, let you populate the space um, as that comes in and Tamanya, any thoughts on your mind this morning? What's on your mind this morning from what we've discussed? Um, I mean, so many thoughts, so many thoughts about how much, um, how much less invisible my labor feels even today than it did three days ago um, mm -hmm. and how uh, extraordinary all of the people who have been able to join us have been uh, and and how many great solutions I've taken away even as a facilitator just taking in um, you know we're all we're all such incredible world builders as parents and theater artists and and just all of the uh, joy and struggle and beauty and wisdom that comes with that I'm I'm over overwhelmed. I have to completely agree, completely agree. Adriana, what's on your mind after these, um, these days meetings? These days, um, um, I have uh, some thoughts uh, that came up for me yeah. um, was a conversation that we had yesterday uh, about that pending question, Tamania, about mm -hmm. teenagers um, mm -hmm. well, um, and how um, the just, um, you know, how, um, how are teenagers being taken care of, uh, right? Especially during this time in the last year and a half with all the changes, you know, you think that uh, teenagers are, oh, you know, they're done. They don't need any, any caregiving. We don't, they're, they're, mm -hmm. there's no focus needed. They're already onto adulthood. Um, but just how um, we brought up also um, how um, that change, right? Going into um, in life and on screen had has affected a lot of people, right? Including teenagers. And I did mention that um, I know I know uh, several teenagers who thrived on screen, and then now going back to being live, it's been a challenge for them. Mm -hmm. um, and just like all the other um, things that may come up, right? When you're in that time um, of um, when you're questioning things and just so many things come up for you and how to support um, that age group. And then something else is um, we, we were able to, probably not in the main sessions, but in, in the smaller sessions, we did talk a lot about other types of care. And uh, I think it's important to, to talk about that to uh, hear publicly and openly uh, because normally when one is experiencing caregiving, other, other types of caregiving, you do feel very isolated and alone and you feel that other people um, are not uh, there with you, you know, to support you or that understand what you're, what you're going through because it's a very private thing and it's not just about what you're going through because there's other people involved. Mm -hmm. And I think the more, um, not that you have to, um, say any specific details, but just to voice it or just me voicing it out into the space, um, just saying that there, uh, there are other people who are experiencing what you're experiencing and it's important to talk about it, even if it's in just affinity spaces, because you do need that support. And as a caregiver, you need to be taken care of yourself. Mm -hmm. and, and, and sometimes we forget to do that. So, some things that, I, that I've been thinking about. Yes, absolutely. Thank you. 
Lisa. Yes. Yeah, go for it. Thank you, Ejana, for saying all that. I, um, I really feel help, um, heard from last night um, with our uh, conversation about other types of support. And I want to say, you know, I, I told this story to somebody uh, just the other day, uh, just the other day, and I'm going to tell it now. I went to a, um, one of the TCG conferences a few years ago, and um, it was a, 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 like a pre-conference on EDI, but I was there representing a, a Black theater. So I was, you know, not really the target of the, um, of the workshop. Um, because, you know, I'm, I'm not Black, Indigenous, or a person of color, but I went to represent this Black theater. And um, so we broke out into sessions, and I wasn't really sure, you know, what it, what it was going to be like, um, because I knew that they had done a lot of uh, EDI work. TCG does a ton of EDI work. Um, we had a breakout session, and the question was, what is your issue? Such a broad question. And we went around the table and when it got to me, I just started crying. <laughs> because at that moment, I um, I was struggling so much. Like, do I get to work? Because I have to take care of this really high maintenance disabled child. And it was a question I was asking myself, but I wasn't talking to anybody else about it. And I, um, I said, just because I have this you know, big responsibility doesn't mean I don't have something to offer. And am I the only one who sees that? That was about, I don't know, maybe uh, six years ago. And I really feel like we've come so far. And this whole summit has just validated you know, something that I've kept in my, in my own heart uh, for all these years, because my daughter's 16, so it's you know, it's literally years that I've been struggling with this. And um, I just want to say thank you. Thank you so much. Lisa, you're, it's just been a pleasure getting to know you mm -hmm. over these few days, and I'm so looking forward to more. I also want to lift up um, for continued conversation our pal chief rep in Milwaukee. Um, shout out to Jamie Lynn Gray, doing amazing things with the Milwaukee Theater Alliance, who's our host organization is also gathering parents, and for anyone listening to this on the stream, gathering parents um, uh, either with disabilities or with children with disabilities to create more affinity spaces throughout next year. Uh, so we would love to invite you to that space and um, continue this visibility, just increasing it so that it starts to feel like full on support. Um, and I would just love to challenge any organizations hearing the generosity of Lisa sharing her personal story that to remember that's a gift that you've been given um, and not an obligation that an individual needs to pass on to you to understand this is, this is why this conversation matters is because there are folks who need access, who are carrying the responsibility of taking care of someone in their family with these disabilities that are complex. And so when they ask for simple solutions that feel complex to you, I think that we all need to have that empathy and compassion to realize, oh, what I'm taking on is not at the same skills where this individual is carrying on their own. How can we surround them as a, as a community? And Lisa, I just hope you find so much more of that support. Absolutely so much more. Um, and to that, I, I would like to, uh, to, to borrow just a little bit more without any names attached from um, yesterday's um, affinity space was, I think some, I, uh, two things that I thought were really interesting came up. Um, that one was uh, the cultural norms outside of the United States and how often elder care and care for the young is simply a community obligation. Like it's something everyone's responsible for. Um, mm -hmm. it, you know, it's something that we all carry together as in, if not a, an obligation or responsibility in honor. And so um, I, I, we were talking last night about maybe how do we disrupt spaces like spaces in the United States that are so often created to exclude that and disrupt them and make, you know, radically include those practices. Um, because many of us, you know, we're talking about either having lived outside the United States or being 
you know, culturally related to places outside the United States and just how kind of appalling it is here, how we, um, we pretend the labor to care for those two groups either doesn't exist or it's an inconvenience somehow, not like it's part of our everyday. So I was, I was telling a story about, um, I have a, a huge family. My, um, father's one of five and my mother's one of eight. And when I walk into a family gathering, someone just hands me a baby and I've got that baby in my hip and I'm changing their diaper and I'm feeding them. And, and obviously this is a family member. I know who this baby, you know, like it's, <laughs> they're not stranger babies. We're not, but um, you know, just stranger that, your baby. Yes, right. that, that, because I have, I have family members who have families of two or three or four or five or six and some with disabilities and some with, and how, um, you know, we've been, in my family and in my culture raised that that is part of your responsibility to the family, to the culture, that the, recognizing the potential of the little ones and what we owe to our elders by caring for them. And, it, and you know, and when you, when you make food, you get up and without even thinking about it, you serve the elders first, you make sure they're comfortable, you make sure they have water or their oxygen tank, or they have space to sit down for their wheelchair, whatever it is, it is just part of eating or part of a gathering or part of, being in a space with someone. And so how, you know, how can we bring that here with us instead of having to leave it at the door and feel like it's strange or out of place? Mm. Um, so I, I loved that thought and that question. Um, and that sort of, that we were all having this dissonance of like, yes, where I'm from too, like, that's just how it is. Um, and then I think another thing that came up last night that I think was, was, was powerful was speaking specifically about elder care, about people with disabilities it becomes so overwhelming often because you're navigating the medical system. You're navigating sometimes, you know, different cultures or different languages and the barriers there and how a, it's not a system where you're supposed to succeed. Like they want you to be as quiet and passive as possible. So they don't want you to complain or ask questions or, but also um, just the complex feelings that go with that, the rage, the anger, the fear, the overwhelm of having to, navigate all these technological spaces, especially in COVID, where things are online or things are on text or things and technologies maybe that elders aren't exposed to or aren't comfortable with. So just the fact that um, there has been guilt or shame surrounding that, like, oh, of course I have to help. Of course, this is who I am. Of course, this is part of it. But just how incredibly overwhelming it is and inhuman the amount of stress that is on one body and one person and how feeling then again, angry or frustrated it's a lot like postpartum like feeling any of those feelings that are not positive you don't have a space to speak about that you don't have a space to feel affirmed in that um and that's why i think the affinity spaces are, are so wonderful and so important but um they need to exist in more places so that we can feel affirmed and less lonely because the challenges of caring for the disabled caring, caring for the elderly caring for the elderly disabled all of those kinds are so big and affect everything in your life, every single second of your life. So I thought that was something I had not often gotten the chance to talk about. And as someone who had a parent who was disabled and, and continue to care for my elders, it's, it's again, something that I have, I never feel comfortable talking about. And I, I share those feelings. 100%. Um, just to lift up a couple of things I, I heard in there. One for those uh, who are just joining us or who don't know, um, last night's affinity space was on other care, including elder care, disability care, um, parenting care that's not talked about um, as frequently or centered as frequently. And so um, a lot of the conversation that's been contributed today um, is, is stemming from that beautiful space. Um, thank you, Adriana and Tamani for holding that space. Um, and also, uh, Tamani, you and I talk about this all the time in, in regards to like, how should power structure itself like how should we create communities but this idea of we cannot dismantle white supremacy without addressing the the hyper isolation or compartmentalization of intergenerational connection this idea of that is so part of an oppressive system is to separate elders and 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 youth from the mainstream which is this bizarre 10 15 year span of folks that we we can we force to stay like idealized and perfect and how do we um how do we integrate no it's this entire life cycle of care that once we're able to take care of that in our organizations we've really torn the productive years yeah thank you we've really that's when we've really started to dismantle 
the oppressive structures because we're cared for for our life cycles. Um, I want to offer into the space, um, Layla, uh, call in organizations who say they are committed to EDI and may not recognize caregiver access as part of that. Yes, that is the message. That is the message of the summit. We said at the opening session, and we've been saying for a while, too often, uh, Powell will hear explicitly, we don't have time to take care of caregivers. We're working on anti-racism. And our response is always, you cannot separate the two. Um, and Tamani, you started to address that a little bit, but we'll go in. I'd like to go in a little bit deeper there. And then it is an honor to be in a caregiving position. It validates how critical you are. I'm so glad that you've experienced that, Lisa. Um, and then, yeah, <laughs> uh, regarding the productive years, Aaron shares, what ages even are those? I feel like no matter where you are, you're somehow outside the mainstream age. That is such a great point, right? We, <laughs> I say sometimes, I'm like, oh, that like you've arrived or established enough that's not a place that's a carrot. It's the thing you're supposed to chase so that you stay in the system. It's like being the right age is what you're supposed to chase to stay in the system. It's not an actual place. It's the thing they just keep in front of you until you burn out, <laughs> collapse on the side of the road, um, or find a space that's like, take the carrot off the stick. You get to eat it for your own sustenance and let's live here with each other. Um, and on the heels of that runaway metaphor, I'd love to chat a bit more about yeah, this EDI calling in to Manya um, in the conversation of recognizing caregiver access as part of EDI integrated in. Um, right, so I, I in, in other work, I do EDI con consultation with theaters. And I think so often, um, as you're talking about, because dismantling a system is difficult and is overwhelming. And often you have to admit you have been complicit in a system that has done great harm. So it's uh, very attractive to pick one thing and to be like, we're gonna get awesome at this one thing. And then you don't have to worry about all these other things. Um, when in reality, all of the other things are, are connected, especially caregiving. And um, I quote often when I do um, compassion training with Powell or when I do my EDI work, um, someone like me who I've been working in theater for 20 years, I have a degree in theater. Um, I've been directing and producing for all that time. Uh, I've been the president of a board. Um, I will make 55 cents on the dollar for what a white man will make for doing exactly the same work. So I basically will have to have two jobs to, to have the lifestyle, maybe, um, that, that someone who is white and cis and hetero and male has just waking up in the morning. And so with that, even just that one metric in mind, um, I have to work twice as hard for daycare, I have to work twice as hard for food, I have to work twice as hard for medical care, if those two jobs even provide it, maybe I need a third job for that. So um, I can't do any of that without caregiving, obviously. And, and then there's access to care caregiving that is high quality that is in the neighborhood where I live that is, you know, providing education. Um, and if you have a multi ethnic child, then we'll honor their their multi ethnic existence in a way that is not harmful and in a way that isn't also filled with white supremacy. And so it's, yes, there's absolutely no way to take them apart and you can only address EDI issues and you can only address the issues of anti-racism if you are looking hard at who has access, who can even get into your space. Um, is that always casting question like, well, we looked, there just were no Mexican actors or we looked, there were no black actors or we looked and like, first of all, where are you looking? Like you're, you know, you're looking the same places you've always looked. But two, um, if you are not a space where people can thrive, people will not come. So if you want people to come, you know, it's, and this is the thing too, of where we find a problematic theater and suddenly we have a person, you know, someone from the BIPOC community, someone who, who has been from a community historically marginalized, and we say, you're gonna come in and fix everything. But if the environment has not been recreated and dismantled to ensure they will thrive, um, they're just going to be a sacrifice on the altar of um, performative change. And then we'll go right back to where we were. So absolutely, if we're going to make that change and we're going to invite people in that have not been represented in the past, we have to address the violence and the microaggressions and the lack of access that has been inherent in making sure that only certain people succeed in this, you know, in this environment forever since it was first created. And that's a lot of work and that's hard, but that is how we're going to get there. If we want the people on the boards and on the 
you know, in the directing seat and in the acting seat and in the production chairs and on, on the staff, we have to get them there first. And then we have to support them once in there and give them agency and give them trust and give them authority. And all of that comes from looking at all the ways we have done harm in the past, which is hard, which is incredibly hard. But I think so often when I see it sort of sussed out into two different categories, that's what the game is. Like I'm, and that's a very perfectionist white supremacist attitude. I'm going to do this thing. Amazing. I'm going to be the best at it. Nope. It's an, also, it's an ongoing process. You don't do it for a year. You don't write one plan. And then you're like, we fixed racism. We're good now. Um, you know what I mean? Like you, you have to, it's, it's an ongoing commitment to challenging yourself every single time, every single thought, every single casting notice, every single, uh, you know, every time you put out a job listing and you're still like, oh, you know, pay determined upon experience and all of that nonsense, like radical transparency, radical representation, radical breaking away of the things that have kept certain people safe and other people out. 100%. Can I just say that what I need to get as a tattoo is the way you put, um, don't make a sacrifice on the altar of performative change. Can I just live in this space, please? Because I almost like fell out of my chair. Thank you for that reality. Um, I will be saying that forever and crediting you. And if we could all take that phrase with us into spaces from now on and let folks know that Tamanya Garza, who we have a pleasure to work with, um, is someone who is speaking the truth. Absolutely. 100%. Yes. Um, we, we have a question in the, in the spirit of AMA. Can I ask the trajectory of the PAL organization, PAL as an organization? So glad you're growing as an order. How do you sustain that growth with the staff that is pulled in so many directions? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, and I also just want to preface it by saying in no way do we say that we've done anything or do anything perfectly, but it's actually in the method of care within those moments of of like learning growth and stretch of tolerating the discomfort of what we're discovering because so often we look at something and we're like okay let's all acknowledge with each other that we're we're making a new thing we're doing a new thing and so there's discomfort there to start off with um but at the same time there are some things that i think we have adopted that are very um, authentically uh, impactful to our growth in a healthy way. And I would actually like to invite um, Adriana and Tamania to speak to those first. They're both national directors at PAL. And so to start off with one, PAL is a shared leadership organization. There's no head of PAL. There are five of us on the national director team. And we each have our um, our passion paths, like you should hear Adriana talk about uh, digital platforms. It's just, it's kind of a beautiful experience. Um, or, you know, like <laughs> Garlia talking about playwrights and, and Tamanya talking about gathering folks together and me talking about nerding out on research. I mean, we just each have our passion points and that's what helps. Um, but the collaboration is that this is shared. Uh, no one person is responsible for moving it forward. So I'll say number one, um, the trajectory is to always uh, continue in a shared leadership um, structure forever and ever. Um, and then I'll throw the ball to my, to my colleagues to share uh, what comes up for you. How do you sustain that growth with a staff? Um, no one is on staff, actually. We provide stipends for folks for projects as well, because we're still an all volunteer organization, but um, we try to work with, with care and financial valuation um, that directly correlates to labor in that way, that you're not just on a salary, so now give your lifeblood, but like, let's talk about this project. What can we budget for it? And how can we fundraise? And if not, how can then we let your time go and, and take care of you? Because you should prioritize yourself, even though you're passionate about this. Um, and that takes constant communication. Uh, we, are, we are a nonprofit. We are a full nonprofit. Um, you are able to make donations and that will go. We, we pay all the speakers at the PAL Summit. Um, we, we pay all our contributors. We do not do unpaid internships. Um, that doesn't mean we don't get tired, but that just means that like when we're tired, we get to say it out loud and say like, mm, I need to, I need to, I need to be honest. Um, but yeah, Tamanya and Adriana, and I will drop the link to donate in the chat, paltheater.com slash donate. And thank you to anyone who can give to support. 
Simone, what do you think the um, trajectory of Powell? I think this is honestly a question we talk about a lot and we've talked about a ton this year um, because growing in COVID is difficult, but growing in COVID, if you're making um, your mission to be ethical and to grow differently, I think is an incredible challenge that um, as Rachel said, we don't always get right, but we absolutely uh, try to start, it, it's baked into the, the very essence of who we are, that it will be different. Like the per, the per project pay um, which requires constant negotiating of like, can you do this? When can you do this? How much will it cost? Is it? So it's, a, it's an enormous amount of labor. Um, again, releases you from that salary of like, well, now you're ours. You will do everything we say. Um, we can load you up with more projects. We can give preference to this person because they have this privilege. Like that doesn't exist. And, and not that it never exists, but like it is so much harder to do that to a person when they can literally by project be like, I don't have the capacity for that or that's not within my passion, or I thought I could commit to that in January. And now that it's December, it hasn't been something I've been able to get to. So I think um, there's a real consciousness about it. I think that we uh, we do have a lot of shared leadership structures. We also have um, a steering committee and we also have a board and we also, we have many, many people who give their time to lead. Um, so as Rachel was saying, we're not, not tired. Like we were waking up talking this morning. I'm like, this is a little bit like running a marathon. Like I should have trained for this. Um, because in my, in my pre baby days, I used to, um, I used to run, um, and Rachel does still run marathons. And I love running. <laughs> um, I did run back in the day though. <laughs> but so, so I think it's, um, yeah, it's, it's exhausting, but there are so many of us and enough of us that we can check in and out and do the things we can do. And not like, I have to leave this session at 11 because I have a family obligation and that's fine. We have enough people in the session that we can absorb that and that's fine. And it's not this like, we're oh, so unprofessional. How dare you, we're streaming this. Like why on earth wouldn't you get someone else to do? Cause, cause I'm a mom and I have mom stuff to do. And this is about moms. That's why, you know, this is about family caregiving and parents. And um, so that is literally the, the skeleton of what we do. Um, and, and I think we're constantly checking in even right before you know, sessions, we're saying, what about this? Who's going to do this? Does this make sense? Do we need to change this? Um, and um, as we go through our work, I think every time we work with people and everyone on this call is a testament to this, we're learning, we're growing because our experiences do not represent every single experience. Um, but also so many of us have multiple experiences, are caring for people with disabilities and elders and are from, you know, historically marginalized groups and our queer people and our people with disabilities. So I think that also making sure that the people in leadership are at, have represent as many viewpoints as possible. Um, I think that's it too. And, and the thing that um, I think, Lisa, you were talking about this maybe last night, I don't wanna call it any names, but we were talking about the whole, um, Rachel Hewitt said earlier that when someone misses in another session, when someone misses something for a nap or when someone does not meet a commitment because they were doing something else, you celebrate that. You're like, yes, that is that is the point. That is the goal. That is, And that's not to say like nothing gets done. Obviously, lots of things get done. Um, but sometimes life picks for you. You don't get to pick when you're going to have a disruption or need to care give in the immediate. Um, and I and I have to say that's real. I remember when the first time Rachel said that to me, I kind of felt like, well, this is a trick. I'm going to get thrown off of the team like who's you know like who's who's taking secret notes that they're going to come back later like have at other jobs when they said no we love caregivers and then when I actually had to take off because I was a geriatric mother at 35 and needed to you know go to the hospital four times a week then suddenly it's like well you know you're leaving a real hole here it would it would be great if um, you could figure out a way to get that work done when you're not here maybe you can stay until eight or nine o'clock at night whatever works for you um, that isn't supportive. So I think that actually is true and exists. Like there, there is nothing I've ever felt like I didn't get to that. And now I feel shame about it. And this is one of the first spaces I've ever felt like that. I want to call out too. I've worked with Sympatico Theater and Power Street Theater, both in Philadelphia that also create spaces like that. Um, but it is rare. And so the honest commitment to that. And it, what I, what I also love about Rachel and the entire team, Adriana, Carlia, Iris, and all of Pal is when you miss something when you disappear when you drop out it's never like why didn't you do the thing it's like how can I support you to do the thing or how can I take the thing from you which I think is again I've, I've really experienced that um and that whole how can I be supportive how can we support you we pass that on to the people we work with and that's how we're disrupting we're refusing to be part of that patriarchal white supremacist perfectionist professionalism shame culture 
that says, I will make up the amount of work you have to do. I will not check in with you and you will do it at all personal cost. So I think that's, that's the long answer to the short question for me, Adriana. Yeah, so um, I think that's the really great thing about shared leadership, you know, because it, it really does take um, that uh, stress and that pressure off of that one person. You know, I, I, there's so many people that feel passionate about different topics. And uh, the great thing with PAL is that you can uh, be involved um, with as little or as much time uh, as you have. And, and even five minutes here is appreciated and valued. And I think everyone does feel valued um, who ends up doing something with PAL. And, and I, I, I love working with everyone, uh, with Tamania, with Rachel, because I never feel uh, like Tamania said um, that my life um, that I have to apologize for any life issues uh, that that come up. Um, it's always embraced and it's more of a, how can I support you? Um, which is, which is wonderful if that was like that everywhere. <laughs> um, and I also love that, that we're also different and we all have different, different passions. Um, you know, I come from a, a very different, um, um, perspective than Rachel does and, and Tamania. And I will always, uh, you know, talk passionately about elder care, or I'm really um, fascinated by um, uh, different types of uh, family building, you know, so I'm constantly researching third party reproduction and, and advances in technology, and what's being made possible for, um, for, for women who want to have children, um, in their 40s, you know, or past 35. I'm, I'm very passionate about um, uh, women being informed and educated about their fertility because it was something that, um, that I came into it a little bit later on in life and I wish I would have known a lot more um, in my earlier years. And uh, there's, there's so many uh, advances in technology and I feel like I always land in the experimental stage, you know, so I'm always like right there in the middle. Um, but, uh, but I think for, um, for any woman who is thinking about family building, it's really important to know um, what's going on and what's possible and what's real and how to look at data. Um, and how to speak to other women about, about things, because the older you get also, um, the more, uh, medical issues that we have as women. And those are uh, things that we also don't talk about. Um, so I, 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 um, I share that passion, um, with, with that, uh, with those different topics. Um, and then I'm also really involved um, with the Latinx Latinx community and what are and what issues come up for us, right? Um, with with our own families, with you know within our own um, the relationships that we have um, with our children, with our extended family, with our older members, um, how we have to translate a lot, how we have to be health advocates um, for our family members. Um, how we have to navigate these systems in the state that are really confusing. I mean, and English, you know, I speak English and it's confusing for me at times. So how, how difficult is it for, for um, people that English is not their first language? Um, so, so, as for, so for PAL, um, there are so many other conversations, right, that will pop up. And so what I see is the trajectory is, for PAL is um, um, it started off um, focusing on caregiver on, on, on artists that are caregiver that are caregiver that are parent artists. That's how it started. And just look how much it's grown. You know, it's just really widened to include like all these all these per perspectives and all these issues that we're all coming up with that we 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 kind of were isolating and 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 kind of feeling like we were alone in and and now there's um there's an opportunity for everyone to really connect with those with each other and to talk about the things that we're all experiencing and and i think also succession is really important because like you know i'm i'm getting tired 
you know, and, and I might want to shift my focus, you know, eventually, uh, or I might not have the capacity, right, to spend so much time um, advocating. Um, and, but I feel, I feel good because everybody that um, gets involved or is part of these conversations, that's one more like person out there, you know, supporting the cause. And so it's, it's really hard to let go, right, of that, to be like, if I don't do this, then who, you know, but it, but, but just the fact that you're here and you're listening and everything, it just, um, um, it's okay, you can step back, because there's other people there, um, who will also be um, bringing these things up um, in their life, and in, you know, and in, in, in different spaces. So I feel okay, right, to be able to step back and 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 like Rachel said, you know, we 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 really try we we really make sure that everyone gets paid. Um, it's really important. Um, and anyone who's who's in the beginning, you know, learning, you know, they they take away so much from the experience of any any projects that we do, and then they get inspired, and then they do their own things. So it's definitely a domino effect. Um, but yeah, so a couple thoughts about that. <laughs> and I can't believe these people are my friends. That's just <laughs> really and, and, and totally respected colleagues and professionals. Yes, thank you both. Just a huge yes, and I believe that kind of the, the clarity that even I received um, hearing you all engage, which again about shared leadership is that you're not left to the devices of your own mind to figure out solutions for an organization. Um, the phrase we're bringing to power this year is communal change. Um, like Adriana said, our advocates are tired. We're all tired. Never do we want PAL to be a space where we say, you're the one who's gonna die on that hill. Congratulations. Or who volunteers as tribute. It's like, whoa, number one, the people in your organization, and this is something that, that we are, I, th I think we're developing more facility to do better. Like Tamani said, this is all an evolution and committed practice, but the people in your organization are actually the first mission of your organization. If you are really trying to seek out how to do things ethically and you're like, okay, for our audiences and we'll bring people in. Okay. So you're going to have to burn a hundred hours this week, trying to develop that pitch deck on equitable work solutions. We have already failed the mission, <laughs> but if we're like, okay, we got to figure out, you know, EDI work for next year, et cetera. And someone's child gets sick or there's COVID exposure at school and they have to drop out. And you actually spend that day figuring out how to engage with this person remotely while they have time to rest and be with their child, you have already accomplished the mission. And, and that's like the rapidity of going slowly that Tamania, uh, oh, Johanna um, introduced in our conversation on disability and care. Um, and we'll have to go back to see um, whose quote it was, but introduced um, at, the, at the speed of consent or like group consent, to work at the speed of group consent and I will admit if anyone, you know, from like the like high end nonprofit world or like a uh, high end production world came into PAL, there are certain things that may feel really slow. Like, what do you mean you have to check in with your leadership team about that? And they're not full time staff. So we have to wait until you get to everyone and it, the email is going to come next week and not in the next 24 hours. What do you mean? But we have actually found that when we embrace the slowness of that speed of, of getting everyone on board in a way that feels supportive and to their own capacity, there's always this like switch that flips where it, then it goes shoom, and it goes forward. And we feel like, ah, oh, okay. Like training for a marathon is very slow, but the race itself is only one day. And I feel like so often we like preoccupy ourselves with like the product, the production of being like, okay, we got to get this out. We got to get it good. And I keep asking us this year because Pell is, is growing very quickly and we're getting all these like nonprofit growth recommendations and some of them very sound, wonderful. I believe in creating excellent structure, but one, our board is still volunteer. We do not have a fiduciary board. Um, and a big reason is because our advisory board, our leaders sought in the field, our directorship board are folks who are mentoring us in engaging with the community and our donors are keeping us going. 
And if that means that our donations stay small, then that's the size that we stay because we always want to be serving and engaging and learning from folks for whom these issues of uh, oppressive workplaces, caregiver realities and needs um, are still a central reality. That's how we're keeping ourselves accountable in our ear to the ground. Um, let's see. Uh, yeah, and, and thank you for that, that question. So in terms of a long range plan, something that we've said this year is we don't wanna grow beyond our capacity for authenticity. So what does that mean? And I know that everyone spent their summers like on strategic planning and things like that. Um, oh, Tamanya, thank you so much. Uh, heading out in a few minutes, we'll see you at the next session. And I think like for those mic drops, I'm gonna be watching this back and like <laughs> writing them down. So much love. Um, Yes, drop out whenever you need. Um, but but in terms of growth, I mean, my my challenge to folks is: can you tolerate slower speeds? Um, can you tolerate smaller budgets? Um, can you tolerate smaller productions? Can you tolerate? Um, can you tolerate doing a strategic plan where we don't ask ourselves? What impact does the organization want to make? But we ask, what is everyone's capacity this year? And grow the productions and the projects from the capacity of the folks in the room. What if someone's like, I really need to work three days a week in the office, but two days at home. And you look at your strategic plan, you're like, we're not gonna meet our KPI goals if you do that. And instead of saying, so you need to come in the office, we say, how can we adjust these goals? Because what if the only KPI return you have is for the 5, 20, 50 people in that room, the depth of impact for the 50 people in that room, in my opinion, is more authentic of a mission than the 500 people while burning out the 50 to get to them. And yeah, that's the great experiment of PAL actually. And what everyone on this call and Garlia and Iris who is currently um, who is currently on leave and still an integral part of this organization uh, are committed to um, as as a structure. So that's our that's our long term trajectory. We want to remain a community for folks to gather. Thank you, Tamanya. Um, a community of folks to gather. We will continue our child care grants because we believe in modeling financial support for caregivers, um, and we want to develop best practices in the workplace to center humanity which is the theme of this summit. Yeah. Yes. Um, how might somebody from, like I'm from California, but I think what you guys is, uh, do is awesome and I would love to like help. So how might somebody be a part um, of your organization if they are yeah. like super far away? Yeah, um, we have chapters all over the country. Actually, what part of California are you in? Fresno, California. Remind me where Fresno is, South Middle. Like Central. Central, fascinating. Okay, so we have chapters in LA, San Diego, and Bay Area. Are you close to any of those? Or are you like, no, I'm like Central, Central. <laughs> Bay Area is like three hours. LA is awesome. like three hours, so I'm kind of in the middle. But listen, PAL started virtually. So when this pandemic happened, we were like, eh, okay. <laughs> we were all tethered to our spaces before because of, of access. So let's just keep going. Um, this is a great opportunity for us to kind of demonstrate when someone writes PAL, we set up a call and we say the first thing, because uh we don't do like unpaid internships and we want to honor anyone who wants to get involved, we want to first ask you. What's the path of your passion? Because we always want anything that you invest to be something that's returning to you in a fulfilling way. So that's my question to you. I'd love to answer your question by knowing, what are you passionate about? What do you love to do? And, and what resonates for you in these conversations? Yeah, for me, um, I love talking. So a little bit, I'm a graduate student at Fresno State um, here in California. And I'm working on my thesis, which I'm talking about um, performance being rhetorical. So like, how does performance, saying like stand-up comedy, theater, Broadway, film, um, have conversations on social justice? And how can we use performance as a platform to talk about oppression? 
Um, and so I was doing research and I found your organization and I was like, wow, I really love what you guys are doing. And so to hear all the conversations that you guys are having is like making me want to help as much as I can and step out more and like use my voice to talk for people that maybe don't have the same opportunities that I have. So what can I do to then help them? You know, so that's kind of where my passion lies. Yeah, that's brilliant. And you're in grad school right now. What, where do you see your path going? Um, which, by the way, your thesis sounds amazing. I saw you <laughs> in the chat the other day and I was like, mm, uh, can I read that when you're done? <laughs> it sounds incredible. Uh, first Thank of all, you. great job. Um, uh, where, where do you see your path going? Because we want to make sure that we're engaging you in, in the direction that feels supportive for you. Yeah, yeah. So I'm not 100% sure, kind of down with the flow of like whatever happens. Um, I know I want to teach, so I think to be able to, um, like, in my graduate program, I'm talking about theater, and I'm talking about how, like, I grew up in theater my whole life. It's kind of what I've done, um, and so I think theater has so much potential that people don't see, um, and they see it just as entertainment, and I feel like there's so much more to performance than it could be. Um, so I think I would like to be able to share how um, educational it can be. And, and so I'd like to, my whole thing, um, I have a degree in anthropology and English, and I want to take those and kind of mesh them together. And if I can mesh that with performance. Um, so as far as like what I'm gonna do with that, I'm not too sure 100% yet, um, but yeah. That sounds amazing. Um, and I'm really, I really hope that, first of all, you see us as a community that you can come reconnect with and recharge, that your purpose that you feel right now sounds incredible and um, you, you deserve to engage in it. And then the next thing I would say is the two things that came up for me is um, one, one of the things that we're really excited about doing this year is starting to engage this conversation earlier in folks' lives, like with graduate students, with undergrad students, so that this isn't a retroactive reality that we all get to engage in, but to say, you're in high school, you're in middle school, isn't drama club fun? Did you know that you, all of these things that we're learning about our agency and our rights and consent in our bodies apply in theater as well? That includes if you want to have a family or if you don't want to have a family and your friend does. Um, reproductive rights and theater, right? Like this connection of how do we start the conversation as early as possible to say, if anyone, so that at the point where we get to say, if anyone ever tells you you have to choose between a family and a career in the arts, you've had so many earlier conversations that get to give you that red flag saying, no, you're wrong. And then, and then have the resources to respond or support yourself. So having, um, having folks who want to help us engage uh, those communities and even like facilitate those conversations, they would be virtual um, where we talk to, you know, graduate students and undergrad students. I think that'd be wonderful. And second, we, you know, Pell started, uh, or my trajectory into Pell started because I started blogging. I started writing about my experiences. And we are always looking for writers to write about the intersection of, of this reality of, um, of the impact that integrating justice into theater and caregiver support into theater can have. So that's wonderful as well. And what we can do is also set up another call so you can process this and then come back and say, I think that after I've worked through this, this is where I would love to participate. Um, the answer is yes, we'd love to have you. And let's talk about where that feels most fun for you too, if that sounds good. Yeah, thank you. And I think the fastest way that you know anyone listening on the call can help is um, to spread the word as well. Let folks know that these resources exist, share the handbook, um, share the the local chapter communities every every month on the third Thursday of every month, we have an open affinity space for caregivers to just come in, zoom in, talk about anything on their heart. So um, spreading the word there as well is wonderful. And you have our email address, so reach out. We'll, we'll set up time. We'll connect with you for sure. Thank you so much. We're so happy that you joined us. That's so exciting, Shariana. And then, and and what's exciting too is because you, you know, you're just um, 
it, there is an unknown for you, right? Of what you really want to do and how you want to um, merge those two things. Um, and it'll be exciting to see like, oh, um, I didn't know that this job existed and, 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 and uh, I really want to do this. So the more um, that you do different projects and, and find like what you love, like you might, you might find that I really love research, but I don't love this part, you know, um, and that we can work together to see like how, how we can, um, uh, uh, use people's strengths, right. Yeah. Um, to, yeah. to create something really cool. It just, it, it, and you reminded me, I, there is, um, I had um, someone who worked with me uh, when we were doing a, a theater festival and she's also an anthropology major um, and is uh, in, uh, in school right now. Um, and we found that she had never, um, she never learned, she never knew what dramaturgy was. And so that's something that we found um, that she's really excited about, which is completely different than, you know, other stuff that she, that she does. So I've been able to, bring her on projects that, that I've been doing. And, and it's really cool, right? To discover something where she can like merge two of her passions. So definitely um, excited that, that you are excited to, um, to work with Pau. Yeah, it sounds all amazing. Amazing. And we'll definitely find some local folks too. One of my favorite things is if anyone is ever in a city, you're like, you don't have a local chapter or something like that. Um, what we'd love to do is also find uh, collaborative theaters or organizations who are doing good work and connect you there um, as well, for sure. We've got about 20 minutes left on our um, AUA, <laughs> ask us anything. Um, so feel free to shoot any questions into the chat. Um, and I haven't checked online, but if you are adding questions on the live stream, we will circle back and... Um, Um, and check in. Um, I'm just really quickly checking in to see if there's anybody um, who's posed a question. Um, no, but it but the stream is going great. <laughs> We're so happy you all are here. Um, I mean, I have a question for you, actually. Um, in in terms. Oh, of can I say something really quickly? Yes. Um, Yes, uh, before I forget, so anyone who's watching um, who is not a mom yet, um, but is interested in, um, in, in motherhood and is thinking about uh, being a single mother by choice, um, uh, uh, I've, I've um, uh, noticed that there's a lot of groups um, in Facebook and also POW has some affinity spaces um, for that as well to talk about that. Um, but just to put that out there, that you are not alone um, in, in all the thinking or the process that you're going through right now, um, especially when you thought that your life was going to go a certain way and you're finding yourself at a certain age um, at a crossroads and, and, and there's decisions that need to be made um, because of, um, of a woman's fertility um, challenges um, that um, that thinking process and all of that, there is a huge support going on um, right now that there wasn't before. And that's something that I have found really exciting um, because I think that was a topic that wasn't discussed much before. Um, and there's definitely so much more information out there and resources. So I also just wanted to just put that out there if anyone is um, watching and is um, in, that, in that journey right now. Um, to know that I'm here if you want to reach out and have any questions, um, but there's also a lot of um, Facebook groups um, that help if you have any questions and going through that thought process. And also, you know, PAL has a lot of uh, resources. Um, so yeah, just wanted to put that out there. Love it. Thank you so much for that. Um, yes, we, we've even had, had affinity spaces, like she mentioned for um, IVF fertility, those conversations. So if there's a, an affinity space that you don't see coming up on our calendar, write us and ask about it because we, we would be very happy to find folks um, in our network who we know are passionate about those conversations and, and make that space for you. Um, Pal is a place where 
it's very much community generated for conversation. Um, there is no happy hour in New York on Monday. There was our first year. So I wonder if you saw an old notice. We are hoping to have a meetup with Fiasco Theater um, for our first PAL cohort meetup in March for New York theaters. We're also working on a cohort meetup in New Jersey. Um, I know that uh, the chapter in LA um, has had an in-person meetup and the chapter in Dallas. So um, definitely check out your local chapters and we're happy to connect you with those chief reps. So if you're looking for people in your, in your proximity sphere um, to connect with, we're happy to. Uh, oh, that's a great question, Jenny. Um, super rad, let's see. I'm, look, I'm talking to folks about starting a development lab in Chicago for caregivers. Would love to know where else in the country I can look for models. Also looking for thoughts on on-site childcare versus reimbursements. Is the development lab, lab for writers, Jenny, specifically or multidisciplinary or all or? Um... Yeah, I'm thinking, I'm thinking writers mainly, but I'm also entertaining um, movement artists because I work with a lot of folks um, who are divisors and movement um, people. Um, so yeah, we're, I'm talking to uh, a few folks about how we can get this going. Um, and in particular, um, if, it, if it's best to have on-site childcare, like what that looks like for folks, or if it's best to um, otherwise find funds to reimburse people for childcare. Um, and I know it's different too, right? Cause when you have a baby, you, a lot of times you need the baby there and I want a space where that's welcome. Um, and then when you have, old, you know, toddlers. So, so I just would love any, any and all thoughts. On that. Yeah. I love it. Awesome. Um, Jenny Lamb, I just want to shout out as a writer, everyone, um, Two Mother's Days ago, our first virtual streaming event was her play Motherload. It's amazing. Um, do you want to just let folks know where they can read that play too? Sure. Uh, yeah, you can go to, um, it's on NPX um, or um, I'll drop my email in and you can email me and I can send it to you. But um, yeah, I'm always excited for folks to read it. Yes, do. It's an incredible piece and it was our absolute pleasure to stream it. I'm pulling up... Um, someone's name right now um, because I just want to shout out. Mm, all right. I have a friend. Uh, let's see. Da, 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 da. All right. I cannot find your email, but if you're listening and you're like, Rachel, I wrote you about uh, an affinity space for writers or caregivers. I got your message. Thank you so much. And I will be replying to so many emails. I used to say right after we're done here at the summit, but now I have learned to say after the summit, I'm going to rest for a few days and then I'm going to start checking my email. <laughs> and I actually like feel like breaking out into hives when I say that, but like I'm tolerating my discomfort. Um, Adriana, I love that in the opening session, you opened up about being a workaholic. That's like so real. So I have to, I'm making a commitment with all of you that I am probably not going to respond to your emails over the weekend. And if I do, it's because I felt inspired, but um, I'm going to commit to starting Monday. Um, but Jenny, uh, we have been getting messages from folks who um, want to start creating spaces like this for play development, uh, you know, whether for just for writers or things like that. Um, and the fast answer is it, it will be multiple points of access, like your, mm -hmm. like your instincts are feeling. So it will be stipends and like you can bring your baby, et cetera. Um, I would say that the, the most complex, um, unless you have a community where folks have children of the, of similar ages, uh, the more diversified the ages, the more complex on-site childcare becomes mm -hmm. because then there's even the, the moment of like, oh, my mom could keep them. And so they stayed home and you've already paid for the babysitter and invested ahead of time. So what I would say is to start off with developing that space, which super awesome. Let's keep talking about how we can support you there um, is one, start with the stipend idea and start with your first company, like really reach out to folks ahead of time. And um, we can help you like create a survey of how much do you think you will need and then what you'll be doing is you'll be fundraising or gathering funding or investing in direct application. And then you can say, we'd like to do reimbursements so that we can have receipts, et cetera. 
But one of the points of access that came up this week was then also saying, but if you need this money ahead of time in order to, you know, pay the person in real time, indicate it here um, so that you also know how much you need up front and how much you can start to develop in that direction. Um, and then I would say, and also the companion piece, what we encourage folks is like, great, you're starting a caregiver fund, make sure that this, this is a cultural initiative. The companion piece to that financial is saying, if you have babes in arms, or if your sitter that we're happy to pay for cancels that day, here's our plan for having kids in the room. And I would just like mm -hmm. create a designated space in the space. And when we did that, um, huge shout out to Women's Theater Festival who partnered with Playmakers Rep and um, our rally um, ambassador and chief reps. Um, we did a reading of Cry It Out. And mm -hmm. in the rehearsal room, babies were welcome. It was, it, you know, very poignant, incredible. Um, they did have larger studio space, but quite honestly, I've seen folks do this brilliantly. Oh, shout out to Rivendell in Chicago, who um, I, in terms of models, uh, like they're a great, they're a great organization to engage with. They have long been doing this um, caregiver support plan, but just some logistics. When you enter the rehearsal space, having a blanket or a designated corner that is for um, the children, even if it's, let's say teenagers, there are seats set up and a table next to an outlet to plug in an iPad, like those sorts of things where we also need to start thinking about this in terms of how do we make children feel like they belong in the space? Not that just you're welcome, we're including you because they're human beings too. So have a designated set space. Um, and then have, if when you have buy-in from the community, usually by creating that space, you could even have on-site mother's helpers, um, which are easier if it's in the same room as you. It's not the same as like hiring a babysitter. You can invite someone from your community that yeah. parents trust. And then just for, you know, to bring the discomfort into the room of logistics and liability, um, we always recommend if you're just inviting someone from the community, always have it be in the same space as the parents under the guardian's responsibility, have that baked into your policy of just, you know, you are still responsible for your child, but are you okay with this member of our community playing with them within your line of sight? And then no diaper changes or bathroom breaks without the guardian. And then what you commit to is we will always break. We will always hold. It could be the most brilliant point in the scene. And if a potty break needs to happen, we say hold. And then that guardian is able to patiently go and we all get to take a breath. The guardian comes back, gets to take a breath because they just like navigated hand washing and water everywhere. And they like re-entered the space and we rejoin. Um, it's, uh, it, it, it feels my numbingly simple, but it's a, it's a totally radical rehearsal flow in that way. Yeah. No, it's super helpful. Thank you. Cool. Yeah. And sounds really awesome, by the way. <laughs> I'm excited for that. <laughs> Thank you. Um, Thank you. Oh, my pleasure. Oh, favorite quote regarding so pacing. Patience is a minor form of despair disguised as a virtue. That's fascinating. I have to, I'm going to have to mull that one over. Um, one of my favorite acting teachers, Ron Van Lu. Um, at our alma mater, <laughs> Adriana, and I both went to the Yale School of Drama, but um, we did not overlap, but it's okay. We're overlapping the best point of our lives. We run Van Lu, um, one of the best quotes that I still carry with me throughout my life uh, in our first year acting class was tolerate your discomfort. And I wanted to share into the space that's very different than uh, suppress the red flags. That's not the same thing. If there are red flags, speak up, use your voice or find a safe space. But if the discomfort is the anxiety of not performing or not like meeting a deadline or not like having a structured rehearsal room where like kids are interrupting, if your discomfort is in being generous with someone else, I also invite you to tolerate that discomfort of the stress that may come from creating access. We wanna be very clear that like, it's not that it doesn't come without worry or without restructuring or without a stress of what if the show's not ready? You're allowed to have those feelings. But when we tolerate that discomfort of what if the show isn't gonna look as good or isn't ready? And we remind ourselves in that tolerance of being kind to ourselves and the person that we're prioritizing over the show, we will reconnect back with the path, getting the show back on track better than 
collateral damage, that person is going to be the recipient of my distress. And I'm just going to prioritize the show. Then I think everything blows up in that moment. So that's, that's, that's my takeaway in terms of like what patients brought up for me. Um, and I see folks joining us. Uh, Adriana, do you have any final thoughts? I think we can probably break for a five, unless you have a last question, drop it in now. And yes, yeah, so I was checking to see if anyone had a question um, yeah. on our Facebook page. And then I was thinking about um, some, some things that we could bring up right as we close this session. Yeah. And I thought it would be really great to maybe mention a couple of tips um, for fatigue and for self-care that uh, people have been bringing into this space um, because there have been some really great ones. Um, so if anyone wants to um, put some in the chat um, as well, but some of them, some of the ones that I loved uh, was, um, 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 who was it that mentioned it? I think it was Laniche um, who said yeah. that um, they have started to send out um, messages, even if they're not going, you know, out on vacation or anything, but if they know that it's going to be a uh, um, a really hard schedule and they're not going to be able to get back to people on time, um, just automated messages, um, which have been really helpful. Um, and then uh, a question that I had asked is how do you, um, how do you deal with when you do send out those messages, um, but people still try to push those boundaries and try to contact you um, either on social media or via text, even though you've, you've, you know, you've clearly established um, that you are not available. Um, and so uh, something that we talked about is um, exactly that. You just don't, um, you don't answer, <laughs> which can be really hard for some of us, right? Especially when a text is like glaring at you um, and, and reclaiming your weekends, um, not scheduling meetings on certain days of the week, um, or scheduling certain breaks um, on your phone to make sure that you are taking um, those moments of, of silence or just of stretching, stretching breaks. Um, people have mentioned dancing, um, mm -hmm. that just moving um, or um, just taking a walk, right? Going uh, out into nature, uh, which is something. And one thing that I really loved is if you're a part of an organization, we have all these community agreements, right? When we have meetings and stuff, but sometimes we don't have agreements within ourselves. And so what are those? Creating internal agreements um, for, for yourselves within, within the group. And I think that that's one of the things that I'm definitely gonna take away because it's so important um, to have those internal agreements uh, with each other. Awesome. Yes, Anne. Yes, and thank you. Yeah. That we did have a session on fatigue and support and so much of what Adriana shared came out of that. Um, I think that that's a session I'd love to see pop up again. I know. <laughs> we don't have to just have annual check-ins on fatigue. Let's check in with ourselves every day, our friends as often as we can. Um, amazing, perfect way to close out. Uh, thank you all so much for your questions and for your support and your generosity and your willingness to uh, talk about the complex and not always defined things that I think are really gonna make a difference. Um, Adriana, do you wanna help take us? Yes, I just wanna thank everybody for joining us for this session here uh, and also who is watching or who, who will watch um, later on um, as a video on demand that we thank you for taking the time either now or later to watch the session. And now we're gonna take a little break. We're gonna take a couple minutes before we start the next session. So I'm gonna start uh, stop live streaming.